good to be here with you today and with Jack McGee, the president of the Justice Institute of British Columbia. He holds degrees in the arts, in law, and international relations. He served as dean of science and technology at George Brown College in Toronto. He began his working life flying Navy and Air Force jets. He has a deep passion for public service and community work. And it is my pleasure to say hello, welcome to Jack McGee. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Fanny. So, uh, the JIBC, it says in the uh, PR papers that it's one of the best kept secrets in British <laughs> Columbia, although it is internationally renowned. Well, we're very fortunate. We have had historically a very strong faculty who have done some amazing things and have earned a tremendous reputation globally. And it is, um, I suppose, a best kept secret because we haven't had the need to market and advertise historically. That's changing now as we move into diplomas and degrees. Mm -hmm. Which means? Which means people can uh, pursue an education with us throughout their careers. Um, we can recruit more people for different, uh, different disciplines because the funding changes that have occurred and the reliance on tuition mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, so back to the <coughs> beginnings. Mm -hmm. I know you weren't there in the very beginning, but you probably know the history. Who founded it? Well, it was uh, a, a group of people. David Vickers um, mm -hmm. was one of the principal um, uh, minds behind this. Right, and, lawyer. Uh, and he was he? he was working in the yeah. in the ministry uh, uh, of the Attorney right. General. He was deputy there. Mm -hmm. And um, Bob Stewart, who wasn't then yet a chief of police for Vancouver, right. he was seconded to go over and help to create it. Patrick McGear was the minister of education. Mm -hmm. And he actually brought us into uh, into life. And Gardy Gardam uh, was the attorney general. So quite a few people. But it was that a tremendous um, a group of people who thought this through and I think did a great job. Yeah, high, pro high profile Vancouver players, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. who, who do you train? Well, we train um, all of the emergency services for the province of British Columbia. Police, fire, paramedics, sheriffs, corrections emergency managers, we do traffic safety education, we train uh, people who are interested in mediation and conflict resolution, we train social workers who come to us after their bachelor degree so that they can uh, specialize in victim services, uh, dealing with complex trauma and that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, if a young person <coughs> wants to go into policing, how long does it take? What's the training like? I know you've probably been in and out of the classroom and in, and in some of the uh, situations. Well, for police officers, uh, first of all, they, we train the municipal police in the province of British Columbia. Uh, um, and they start by being hired by the department, by a department within the province. The province then sends them to us for training. It's uh, 35 weeks. They spend about uh, a third of it uh, in what we call block one getting used to being police officers, learning how to deal with all the different um, weapons and so on. And then they spend about a third of it back out on the force, working with the people on the job. And, um, and then they come back to us for a final third where they specialize, refine their skills and knowledge and benefit from the time that they've had actually working out on the street. So you work with the <laughs> psychological aspect of policing yes. and the technical aspects of policing. All of the above. The legal, operational, everything, yes. Uh, tell me what happens when uh, you put them in a situation. Say, a uh, young police officer goes to a domestic call. How do they learn to do that? We have an apartment in the, in the JI where uh, we use it for a variety of things, drug busts, domestic violence mm -hmm. situations, and so on. And so they have to go into that apartment building as if they were approaching a home and um, deal with whatever they encounter there. Right. And so we have people inside who are actors and they are felons or victims or whatever is required for them to be and they play out that scene and the police officer has to deal with it. Sometimes they face uh, assaults and weapons, mm -hmm. sometimes they don't, uh, but it's, uh, it's all an educational process. So we use a lot of what is called simulations to add the realism to our training. Uh, grow ops, everything. Yes. Any, anything they m might encounter, really. Suicides, using negotiation skills, mm -hmm. attempted suicides, mm -hmm. whatever they have to encounter, yes. Really? Who grades them? Uh, other police officers uh, on our faculty or former police officers that we, we hire. 
and in some cases it's lawyers depending we uh, law is a very important part as you can imagine of mm -hmm. their understanding and so our faculty are all specialized uh, very very well qualified and and they do very rigorous grading and the weapon part uh, the electroshock weapon the conducted energy weapon uh, most of us call it a taser, but yes. I know that's a brand name. Yes. Uh, who trains them on taser? Who trains them on uh, Glocks? Well, again, we have very specialized people who do that, and all of our training on weapons is, um, is under the standards and scrutiny of the province of British Columbia. There are very, very strict criteria about the curriculum and how everything is done. There are BC standards which we adhere to and so on, and they are constantly being revised and, and, and um, refined. Mm. And are they taught to shoot to kill? I know this sounds like a, a TV <laughs> drama, <laughs> but w w what is a police officer taught about they're in a dangerous situation? Do you shoot to wound, shoot to kill? Well, there are, there are several things. First of all, there are force options. Uh, and you don't end up wanting to go to shoot. You want to use the, the, mo the least lethal uh, way of stopping the individual or group mm -hmm. uh, that you can. And even if you start down a path where you're going to have to or believe you're going to have to take some, uh, use more force, you want to get out of it if you, if you can. So your voice is probably one of your best weapons. And, but you know very quickly, intuitively at, at points, what you're going to encounter and what you're going to face. So if you draw the weapon, you want to get it back in the holster. You don't want to have to fire it. But sometimes it's a split second decision. If you do have to fire it, you have to fire it precisely. So we train people to shoot to kill because they have to fire precisely when they're under threat of attack. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a, a, a risk of collateral damage, and it's a, it's a strange term, really. But if you're firing at someone and you miss, or if you fire randomly and you impact innocent people, mm -hmm. that's not helping you, it's not helping society. So again, it's a judgment about how can I make sure that the person that I'm shooting, I need to shoot, and that um, I'm not going to injure someone else. Can you shoot again? I can. Uh, who taught you? Well, I learned in the armed forces. <clears throat> uh, it was a part of what I did, and the odd time I go down to the range and, and have an opportunity to see if I can still fire it. <laughs> and? I, I, I still fire it. <laughs> still fire. Do you hit the target? I bet you do. I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So take me back to your roots, your beginnings. Uh, Air Force pilot? I joined uh, the Royal Canadian Navy. I came to Esquimalt on a two-year venture plan, as they called it. Uh, and it was really a very fun opportunity for a young, lots and lots of studies, which I didn't think I was going to have to do, but very mm -hmm. heavy in academics. But we also learned all the operational things about being in the Navy and uh, we had a couple of cruises, uh, one to South America, one to Hawaii. Uh, in my second year, we learned to fly, and then I went to the Air Force, the RCF, to take their flying training program and get my wings. Went back to the Navy, learned to fly off the carrier. Uh, your first solo, will you ever forget it? No, I don't think uh, I, don't think I will. I, it was just a wonderful experience. <laughs> <laughs> kind of frightening, though, when I figured I have to go back and land now. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I, I can't imagine. Like, I've uh, flown in a small plane, and uh, I know something about small planes, but I'm just saying, uh, in a jet. And, and, and your fellow officers or, or uh, young men, young women who washed out, what happens? Do they use that term still? Yeah, yes, Just you do, and it, it happened a couple of cases in, in the first two years at the Venture Plan. Uh, we started with 92, and I think 36 of us graduated. And so, mm -hmm. and some of those people we still still meet and chat with, and they've had very successful careers outside of the service. Um, one, one left us and joined the Air Force, and we saw him, and uh, that was kind of fun. Right. Um, but, um, and, and in flying training, of course, you do, you do lose people as well. Mm -hmm. But our, our um, retention rate was actually very high because the Navy d went through a very rigorous selection process, both for um, the aptitudes that you need in aviation as well as at sea. Rumor has it you uh, flew the Queen around or some of the Royals, some dignitaries <laughs> during was, your career. I was very fortunate. I had a wonderful opportunity to fly, um, to fly uh, dignitaries, including the Royal family. Um, the, 
I had just converted onto the aircraft when I was told that we were going to be flying the Queen and I was going to be the mission commander. I wasn't qualified in the airplane, so I wasn't sitting in the seat to actually uh, flying her. But uh, subsequently, I flew the Queen Mother and Prince Philip and really? uh, about five or six others of the royals. And did they chat with you? Yes, they do. I had some great chats with Prince Philip, in, in fact, and Prince Charles. That was fun. Mm -hmm. and Princess Anne was fun, too. I'm sure. Margaret, yeah. <laughs> Rumor has it. Yes. <laughs> yes. What, what's the protocol when you're uh, uh, working with the royals? Well, first of all, it's very formal, as you can imagine, and everything is fairly precise. You have very tight timelines that you must adhere to. Mm -hmm. So we went through that uh, process of meeting them officially, um, and then they would go into the stateroom. I'd go up front to, to fly the airplane. Um, I'd go back and say hello briefly um, to see how things were and if they needed anything, uh, anything else that needed to be done for them. And, uh, and then on arrival, go back and see how the trip was and discuss when we were meeting again, if we were flying them on the next leg and so on. But it was all fairly formal, and, and unless there was a downtime in which which was more, most enjoyable. <laughs> more fun yes. when you and Philip were chatting. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. what, his passions uh, are many. Yes, he is. Well, he loves flying, and um, and so we had lots of lots of fun with that. And in fact, when I flew him out of Edmonton, he actually flew to Edmonton from the UK. Really. And uh, so we had a chance to talk about different airplanes and yeah. that sort of thing. Probably easier then. I uh, well, now that Harry's got his pants on, <laughs> <laughs> things aren't so bad. But. Uh, I, when you're watching a royal, which I know you know about this, and you train people to watch dignitaries and U.S. presidents and prime ministers, mm -hmm. when that's your job, and something, and uh, this is a diversion, but you go to Las Vegas and you would think that Harry's people, Prince Harry's people, would say, no cameras, <laughs> no phones, like if you're coming in and Harry's drinking or whatever, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be something that somebody would prevent him from getting I, I into would, trouble with, wouldn't you think? I would have thought so. I was never in that situation, but I would have thought so. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll take a break. When we, when we come <laughs> back, we'll talk more about the GIBC because uh, certainly firefighters, uh, paramedics, security, yes. uh, private security people too? Yes, indeed. Trained at the GIBC? Yes. Okay. We'll be back with Jack McGee.